This is Halifax, the capital of Nova Scotia. Unless you live here, you probably don't know that across the water, just over the bridge, is Dartmouth. Dartmouth is home to a group of high school friends, actors, producers, and a crew who create and shoot Trailer Park Boys. Welcome to Sunnyvale, my life since 1998. I like your Sunnyvale smile. This is Mike Clattenburg, creator and director of Trailer Park Boys. This is me. I am the makeup artist, the hairstylist, the dog wrangler, and I've even been a background performer. But before any of that, I married Mike. Apparently Mike was a package deal, because as it turns out, I also married the show Trailer Park Boys. I have been with the Trailer Park Boys since its conception, so I thought I'd give you a glimpse of the Trailer Park life. The corporate office, the creative table, and lastly, my favorite place, the park. Sunnyvale is the place we call home right now, but the Trailer Park saga started in 1998 with a short film Mike made called One Last Shot. Well, I was working with uh, Rob Wells and uh, Jean-Paul Tremblay. And we'd done a few little short films. We really got the bug. We really had a good time. We really worked well together. Rob, you're growing marijuana. That's not a business. It's illegal. Oh, it's not a business, is it? The perfect product that costs you no money. You sell it. You make money. It's very demand product. Everybody wants it. You're going to smoke your profits. They had the same kind of energy and, and uh, excitement about it that I did, so it wasn't hard to rally them to, to come together and to start to shoot stuff. They are Rob Wells and Jean-Paul Tremblay, Mike's best friends and the original co-writers of Trailer Park Boys. Part of the Trailer Park myth is that they and their castmates never appear out of character. So in true Trailer Park fashion, we are going to honor the myth. I think it was around 1998, I was kind of fascinated with uh, the show Cops, I was watching it all the time. As a cameraman, I was really interested in how they were shooting the show, and it was one of the first cinema, true cinema verite documentaries. Uh, it was true fly on the wall, nothing was set up or planned, the cameras coming in, people were kind of like, they would see the camera come in, they'd kind of glance at it like that, and I found that all very interesting. And uh, so I kind of, the idea of Cops from a criminal's point of view um, kind of occurred to me. Between the short film One Last Shot and the movie Trailer Park Boys is when Mike really developed his unique comedic sense of storytelling. And Rob and JP began to define their characters, Ricky and Julian. I just told him I'm going to die in five days. Are you serious? Yeah. Well, fuck, man. Like, that's not good. When did this happen? The other night I gave him a call. A phone psychic. Man, are you fucking retarded? I don't believe in those fucking assholes. It's not a psychic, man. That's five ninety nine a minute. Let's go get some food. I started to shoot this thing uh, where Ricky and Julian um, are pet assassins. The absurdity of that is kind of a satirizing uh, some violence uh, on television and, and some of the violence in films I was seeing. Fuck! Squirrel! Squirrel! We all really got off on it, really had a good time to come back, we'd watch it, and we would laugh, and that was our, that was our pay, to sit back and watch something that uh, was funny, and uh, it kind of came to be Trailer Park Boys. The Atlantic Film Festival was very important to me for many reasons. It was always an inspiration. You know, once a year you get to watch your film in front of uh, a crowd, and you'd learn, you know, what worked, what didn't, and it was always exhilarating. We're looking for a black cat here. It's about eight to ten months old. It's been uh, fucking the neighbor around. I guess he's got a bird feeder, and the cat's been fucking around eating all the birds. So, actually, there's a fucker right there. I'm always absolute my own worst critic, so I'm always uh, looking for what doesn't work. So my first impression is always that it doesn't work. Um, what could be better? And um, you know, there's cer there certainly were some good laughs, and it was engaging. People watched the thing, but uh, my first impression of it wasn't uh, a good one. Later, when people started to tell me that, you know, people I respected, like Barry Dunn, he said, really engaging characters, good story, 
And he really got it, he really enjoyed it. I woke up the next morning and my first thought was, this can't stop here. Yeah, Barry gave me a call when I was doing Pit Pony, and Barry's always been a mentor of mine, someone uh, who has always given me a lot of support and uh, confidence. He said, Mike, I have to talk to you about something. I I'm not going to tell you what it is because you're going to think I'm crazy, but I I can we see, can I, can I come up and see you? He came out to talk to me about this and said uh, it could work on television, and I thought, that's crazy, this will never work on TV because it's just the language, is, it'll never end up on television. This was my thought. He, if I pitch this to Mike and he hates the idea, he's going to lose all confidence in anything I ever say to him again. So that was my big fear, that he was just going to say, oh, God, this guy's an idiot. So he came and said, let's try it for television and, um, and pitch it as a 12-episode series. And so I thought, great, let's try it. That's how it started. I drove back the next day and got a speeding ticket, which I'll never forgive Mike for. We first thought it would be a good show for the Comedy Network, and, uh, and Barry had some connections and set up a meeting. It wasn't until November of 1999 that we thought we're ready to go to Toronto to start, to start pitching the story. And we kind of rolled up to Toronto. We, we were, you know, kind of hearts pounding, waiting to do this show for the Comedy Network. And, and when we met uh, the rep, I knew instantly. I just knew from the vibe, before we even spoke or pitched, that there was no chance. Uh, it was just a very, very cold uh, vibe, un uninviting. And uh, I just kind of thought, okay, this is not going to go anywhere. I forget, Mike said or I said, what do we do now? Where do we, who do we go to now? And I think it was Mike that said, well, what about Showcase? And I remember thinking, well, I don't know. Jeez, I don't think they're doing that kind of stuff. So I don't even know their number. Who do you call? The phone rang and I picked it up and I, you know, Laura Michael Chishin, Showcase Television. And it sounded very scratchy. I think he was on a cell. I think he was in the car with Barry. Um, and the two of them, it sounded like he were exhausted. He sounded a bit on the edge. Um, it sounded like he'd likely had a couple of meetings that maybe hadn't gone so well in Toronto. And he said, I'm in town for a day and a half and I have a show to pitch. And I hadn't seen Trailer Park Boys the movie and I told him, honestly, I hadn't seen it, but I said, I'm intrigued. My bosses at the time, Norm Bolin and Phyllis Yaffe said, Laura, it's time to really ramp up an original production slate. And I said, thank gosh, because this was something I thought the channel long needed to make itself known and have a brand. And so we were in the midst of, you know, soliciting proposals and talking to various people because we'd never done this, so it was a bit new to us at Showcase. Laura was very uh, open and, uh, and, and wanted to see us. She wanted to talk to us, and we felt we were talking to someone who was on our w wavelength creatively, very receptive. Uh, so the first impression was quite a bit different than... Um, than the comedy network. They came in with the pitch package, you know, it was a really well put together package, but it was like 13 one hours, black and white, unscripted, and it was a low budget, and they had the movie in one hand and this document in the other, and I was like, well, why would we make a one hour, 13 part series in black and white? Like, who the hell is going to watch that? I mean, keep in mind, this is before The Office, this is before Curb Your Enthusiasm, this is before HBO was really a big uh, channel in the US. There wasn't really that much of a model of, of cable drama really being something worth noticing. When Mike and I left The Office, I remember, I think we just embraced. Because I think we felt that she liked it. I think we felt that we were going to hear back from her. And I remember taking home the movie and I put it on that night and actually it was my husband as well who, you know, prides himself on thinking he's, you know, he, and he is kind of hip. We watched it and he just turned to me about halfway through and he said, if you don't make this TV show, I'm going to take it to like CTV or someone else because it's going to be great. There was a huge stamp of approval in my own household and it started from there. We circulated the documents and, and there were a lot of hot and heavy conversations here. Everyone watched um, the black and white pilot. Um, everyone looked at the material. Al McGee, who was our creative consultant, was brought in and he looked at a lot of, of the material as well. Good morning, boys. Sorry, I just woke up. Well, I think my initial thoughts were that this could, this could never work for television. It was just... It was, it was too wild, it was too untamed, it was too profane. It had, it, uh, on the surface, it had no redeeming values. We had to get the show through Phyllis Yaffe, who was, and still is, you know, the CEO and president runs, now runs everything, but at the time was in charge of the channels. And um, she looked at it and just said, well, this is interesting, you know, what's the budget? And then I remember showing her some of the movie and she said, it kind of looks bad, doesn't it? <laughs> and I was like, well, Phyllis, that's part of the charm. Don't worry about the care, boys. Come on in, I'll pay for it.
was black and white and was a bit scratchy and it's about the handy cam and yes a lot of it is out of focus but that's the charm and, and she was like we'll see how charming that is so she she absolutely gave us freedom but you know she is a tough critic when i first heard about the trailer park boys it was on a list of programs we were contemplating commissioning and it was really a very small idea and i think people thought it was with a group of people uh, who brought it to us who had not got a lot of television experience and it was the highest risk of all of the ones on the list and the most likely to cause huge difficulty in its nurturing but also in its production. After Mike and I came back from Toronto having pitched Showcase, that was in November I'm pretty sure, uh, we didn't hear anything for, for a month. I, I think it was three days before, I think it was December 22nd or December 23rd, I forget the exact date. Laura sent me an email very brief email. She says something like, we're thinking six half hours, half hour eps, was I think the word she used, half hour eps in May, color. What do you think? In early January, they came to me and they'd just gotten off the, the showcase meeting they had. And so I think essentially what they said was, get an experienced producer. I think that was what they said, find an experienced producer. And so, well, they couldn't find any, so they got me. <laughs> Yep, someone was actually going to put Trailer Park Boys on TV. Okay, let's play but both Trailer Park Boys and Showcase would have to bring their great minds together to get this crazy show to air. The initial discussions about the nature of the show happened via con conference calls. Um, so you're, you're pitching an idea or defending an idea and you're looking at a little machine and just hearing Sss. Conference calls didn't seem to work with these guys at all. And Mike would drum all through them. So the phone would be on the table and he'd be drumming on the table and we couldn't understand a word they were saying. We'd try and get him to stop, he'd stop, and then two seconds they'd be drumming again. What we did find is that sometimes humor doesn't translate so well over the conference call as it does in person. We used to have these incredibly contentious conference calls with all the guys in, uh, in Halifax. We'd be in Toronto. And uh, Volpe at one point said, uh, so what's your slogan again? And someone just instantly answered, television without borders. And then I remember vividly, it, was, it got pretty heated. Then, so I remember saying, so it's showcase television with some borders. And there was about a five second pause. And there was a long pause. <laughs> And on our end, kind of, oh, touche, good for them. And uh, we dove kind of back into it and pushed those borders a little, a little further. Up until we started shooting Trailer Park Boys, the Trailer Park production office was the phone in our home. Every issue from visual format to language was hammered out by long distance. I listened and watched as Mike paced the floor, defending his unconventional ideas to programming. I had to feel kind of sorry for Showcase sometimes. Mike can be stubborn. But then again, if he wasn't, maybe Trailer Park Boys wouldn't be what it is today. I remember a lot of calls that um, almost ended. And I also remember a lot of laughter. I remember um, Alan, Laura, and myself, you know, Mike would just at a very tense moment would just crack us up and we would laugh so hard that we would be crying. I remember one question we asked him, you know, very typical broadcaster question, you know, you have a scene in a strip club in a certain episode in season one, how are you planning to shoot it? And Mike Clattenburg said, you know, have you heard of Raging Bull by Martin Scorsese? And Al and I started laughing so hard that just tears were pouring down our face, but it was like silent laughter. Well, a after a while, um, when the conference calls weren't going so well, and I was feeling uncomfortable and not caring about things, I started to mispronounce some pretty famous names like I'd say, well, you know, an actor like Al Pacino or Robert De Niro are, you know, well, those aren't available to us or uh, Martin Scorsese and, and I would deliver it deadpan thinking that they were going to call me on it. We can hear them snickering on the other end, but didn't know what, we knew they were mocking us about something, but didn't know for what. And then years later it sort of comes up, Mike has a thing where he likes to force you to correct, um, correct mispronunciations of people's names. That's kind of one of the things I bring to Trailer Park Boys is it is this possibly real? But think about it, it's so absurd that I mispronounce five massive movie star names in the two seconds, you know. It's an unusual sense of humor, yes, but um, I think I was kind of somewhat frustrated. 
and just trying to lighten things up, you know, trying to lighten it up a bit, um, you know, doing a comedy and everything. I married Mike for that sense of humor because I thought even when the chips are down, this man will make me laugh. Oh my God. Julian, shut up. I think in the beginning, people wondered if Trailer Park Boys was for real. The documentary style, shaky cameras, and actors that were new to the business. They all presented something not seen on TV before. But Mike's cast of characters were so strong and so lovable, they became the real charm of the show. Drink that, please, buddy. I wanted to come up with um, a concept that motivated the cheap look. What in the fuck is going on here? Well, I decided to hire this film crew to document my life. Um, it had to be this cop-style show. And if it was anything different, then it was just drama or comedy shot on video. Um, it was very important to me to make sure that it was mockumentary Get shot on video out of here. Get out of here. with the idea of Get kind of an amateur community college crew who don't have a lot of experience shooting. Uh, that was the look and the style, you know, the caught on video, home video look. Money got to us around, but you can help out at least. There's no cheap way to do a funny TV show. The, the, you know, just because it's mockumentary on TV, that's not an answer. You can't just say anything, everything's a mockumentary, boom, we've got a great show here. It, it's about characters, original characters. Um, that are funny, and as long as if it's funny, it doesn't matter what format it is, you know, it's gonna work. Originally, when we shot the pilot, Trailer Park Boys the movie, there were no scripts. In true guerrilla filmmaking fashion, Mike liked the freedom that working from outlines offered. That's a wrap, ladies and gentlemen. Their original approach was very experimental. They didn't want to write scripts, and you know, TV networks that are spending lots of money on TV shows need scripts. Even if just to prove that we, you know, we did our due diligence on a story and we got something for the file when all hell breaks loose. So eventually they did scripts, but they did scripts with a lot of kicking and screaming. I actually remember the evening it was with uh, Norma Laura at the Gem restaurant on, on DuPont where you finally agreed to do scripts. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I don't remember that meeting. Did we actually oh yeah, yeah. It was a very late day. We, about, we took advantage of it because we were quite drunk. And uh, <laughs> you finally said, okay, we'll do scripts. And then about two days later, all these scripts arrived. Right. Like you'd had them all the time. Well, I thought, geez, you know, if, if, they're, if they're willing to go with this crazy sense of comedy and this ridiculous show, then I'll, sure, I'll write some scripts. I've got a plan, all right? It's called Freedom 35. Originally, I wanted to do the show more like one-offs, um, more like uh, The Simpsons, where there is no series arc. And... Um, you know, no Freedom 35 or no no overall goal because I just wasn't buying those contrivances anyway. And I like the idea of these individual crazy episodes where just this absolute insanity breaks out. And there are some themes that we, we revisit, but I personally resisted um, the conventions of um, of overall story arcs and things like that. The other man with no shirt is Randy. My sense of humor, you know, it's anyone's sense of humor is from all the people they meet in their life and, and, uh, and their environment. And uh, I, I was very fortunate to grow up in a very loving environment, but a, a, uh, certainly a, uh, you know, a dysfunctional family. I, I had just so many different people around me that uh, um, had so much influence on me. And I always grew up with um, swearing coming constantly at me, and it was never... For me, I was never not allowed to swear. And um, then I would come into circles where people didn't swear. And I would notice a difference. And I would see some people kind of uptight about swearing. I thought we were fucking retired. Calm down. Then uh, this strange uh, absurdity with swearing uh, kind of struck me. Just in, in environments that are very, very non swearing environments, um, I would start to think of swearing because it was always all around me. It always kind of would crack me up. Language was never really an issue with the show uh, in terms of using it. We were always able to use it, but we were regulated to some degree on, you know, the FPMs, the fucks per minute. You know what? Fuck you and fuck your car and fuck your lawn. I'm going to my dad's to get drunk. You just lost a friend. In the scripting process of that first season, we were getting, we were talking about FPMs, fucks yeah. per minute. <laughs> 
<laughs> and I'll tell you how crazy it got. I mean, really, because in, in the first season we did six shows, and in every, and in every show initially in the scripts, it was the, it, the fuck was in the title, I think. Or, yeah. Uh, Jim Lee, he's a drunk bastard. <laughs> yeah. And they're worse than that. What the fuck happened to my trailer park? Uh, what the fuck happened to Mrs. Peterson's dog? I remember being on the phone, Mike. You must remember this. Remember? Okay. All right. So, all right. Uh, and we can't have fuck in every title? Okay, I'll tell you what, man. we'll give you guys one cocksucker, but you guys give us three fucks in the title. <laughs> and it was like, it, I'm not kidding you, there was a, it was a serious was conversation serious. we had. It was a serious right? conversation. We, we were like negotiating yeah. fucks and cocksuckers over. <laughs> and we lost on the, uh, we lost on, well, we won eventually on the cocksucker. But, um, and we got two fucks in that first season in the titles. That was it, though. So I'd like to make a request under the People's Freedom of Choices and Voices Act that I'd be able to smoke and swear in your courtroom. Because if I can't smoke and swear, I'm fucked. Again, it goes back to fucks on the page. You see so many fucks on the page, and um, they really jump out. And if an actor performs them, um, and they really become part of some emotional communication, like they're not just uh, gratuitous, then they work. Knock, knock. Who's there, Rick? Somebody. Somebody who? Somebody whose ex-wife owns a fucking trailer park. The only reason you got the job as trailer park supervisor is you got fired from the police force because you're fucked up big time, but we're not going to talk about that, are we? And now you're going to get fired from this job because you're nothing but a drunk fucking idiot. You can't even run the trailer park. You're drunk right now. I can smell the fucking liquor on you from here. Go away for 18 months to jail and everything goes to fucking shit, doesn't it, Leahy? Let your little buddy use this fucking no shirt movie with my girlfriend and ruin my whole fucking life. Now there's fucking shit everywhere in this fucking trailer park. Cocksucker was verboten. And uh, I, I, I really thought it was absurd and funny in, in a, few, a few ways. I wanted to try it in a few ways. So if you watch season one, you'll see uh, Bubbles talking about Plato. And he pulls the cock on the, the cocksucker. Plato's the smartest man that ever lived. He said it's okay to lie if it truly benefits the cause of the people. Cocksucker called it the noble lie. And you could still discern cocksucker, but he doesn't necessarily say cocksucker. And then, so they, they were like, they were cool with that. They, they got the humor of it. Fucked everyone over. All right. Well, maybe uh, this cocksucker here, I found him in a storm drain. Come back for those cocksuckers later. I'd like to see that red, blue, green cocksucker put one of those together. Cocksucker! You know, you get fine cut number five, and it's still there. So it's like, <laughs> obviously, <laughs> they're not taking it out. So now it has to, that tape has to cycle around the building. So, you know, we have these fantastic bosses and, and they look at it and go okay pass it on and they pass it on and they pass it on and then it goes to a team of lawyers and then from the lawyers then there's a huddle then there's a phone call and it's okay well let's let's try it and you see what happens and then it, you know you wait on Sunday night and Monday morning for the phone calls they don't come it's like okay that's no way. <laughs> they were very flexible in that way um, because they wanted the shows to be funny funny and in the end we all had to share the same sense of humor it was important to Mike that swearing was accepted as the everyday vernacular of his characters. He wanted to make a TV show that represented real people and how they sometimes spoke. He wanted it to be believable dialogue. <laughs> Have I mentioned how hard we laughed every time fuck made it to air? Trailer Park, well, that was a uh, necessity being the mother of invention. Uh, there are freestanding sets all ready to go, perfect circumscribed little story world. Um, you know, if you're going to do a story about the moon, you need to build a moonscape, right? So um, that was available to me, and I had uh, the resources to pull that off. I could go walk into a trailer park, that's the set, it's ready to go. The very first park we shot in was in Sackville. It was a beautiful park. Lots of great trees, older trailers, which I like. I like the ones that don't have all the siding. Um, a lot of pastel colors, and they just look gorgeous. They look beautiful. And uh, we shot there our first season, and uh, the owner saw the show, uh, or heard about the show in the language, and he was like, no way, he didn't want any part of it because the language is so crazy. Uh, so he said, forget it. But the thing was, he owned 11 trailer parks in, in Metro. He owns them all, pretty much. So we were really screwed. And uh, so the second year, we found a very, very small park in Dartmouth. Uh, we irritated some people there in season two because Mr. Leahy and Randy broke up. Mr. Leahy's let the trailer park go to shit, and uh, so we were, you know, running around throwing fucking chairs around and lighting cars on fire. And anyway, so that trailer park was uh, was a rough one, and uh, they didn't really want us back. It was pretty intrusive. 
season three we shot in Timberley. It was a great park. It was a much smaller park. I really liked it. Uh, same problem, one main entrance, trucks, people, and after six, seven weeks of that crap, you know, people are like, you know, that's it. It's just too, it, you know, it's always interfering with people coming home, blah, blah, blah. Season four, we shot uh, in Eastern Passage, uh, a nice park. They said, look, we, we'll, we'll allow you to shoot your show, but we can't have you in the main park, so we had to shoot on the outskirts of the park. So we wanted to build this big wall right in the middle of the park where Ricky would uh, control, you know, this part of the trailer park, and we had to put it on the outskirts of the park, so it kind of screwed up our whole story logic it just wasn't as good as it could have been you know people live there that's their home so we take whatever we can get and make it work gunfights explosions fires night shooting all these things that you can't do in a privately held park where you have people with kids and dogs and lives as it were so for the first four seasons when we shot in privately held parks that was a big problem for production um, you know that just couldn't do what we wanted to do we were restrained by those any other television show you have complete control of your set uh, or location you know um, and over the years um, people people needed to walk through the set that people lived there so you would always have to stop production when you're shooting you don't want to interfere with people's lives it's not like we, we show up at a park and say we're just gonna do whatever the fuck we want it's like you feel you feel for the people that are coming home and it's it's an added stress People are mowing lawns, people are living their lives, and we're like, can you stop mowing your lawn? Can you stop? And after a while, you start to feel, you know, um, pretty intrusive, and, and you're not comfortable shooting. So it was time that Sunnyvale got a new home, and this home was in Dartmouth. This park is special because it's permanent, and it's ours. We can yell and swear. Corey Trevor, I don't know where the fuck you guys are, but you are fucking dead! Oh. Drive fast. Ah! Are we gonna shoot guns off 24 hours a day? That works for me. And disturb no one except ourselves. This is Andy Miller, the art director for Trailer Park Boys. Andy is responsible for interpreting Mike Clattenburg's scripts and visions for the park into reality. Mike loves them because he goes way beyond the call of duty. Well, I'm gonna go back a little bit in terms of art directors. The very first person who worked on the show was the Reverend Bob Chasson. And Reverend Bob had an uncanny knack at designing things in the trailer park. And I think that really, that really caught Andy's eye when Andy came on board in around the uh, fourth season. Um, and then Andy brought a, his whole experience to it. His ideas um, always excite me and they're always right on the money. What else makes this park special is that it cost about the same to build as it did for us to rent previous parks. Made out of trailers no longer inhabitable and articles reclaimed from the side of the road, Sunnyvale is the ultimate in recyclable programs. Here I get a call from Mr. Clattenburg in, I believe it was late April or early May of 2004, and he said, I want to build my own park. And I said, and asked me if I could help him find a spot. And I said, yeah, I'm a little busy right now, but let me think about it. Um, thought about it for a couple of days and then came up with the location where we have built our park here. And the advantages, well, they're, you know, multiple. There are just so many things that we can now do that we couldn't do before. It was in, like, you know, the end of May, June. Complete and utter spring swamp in here. I don't know if anyone at home has moved trailers into a wet, marshy land before with a bulldozer. <laughs> but it's not easy. <laughs> and then to skirt a trailer and put a deck on it and paint it and make it look like it's been there and not fuck over the grass and everything around it. And the fact that we had trees here at all was a bonus. And then we imported five trees with a giant tree spade and Mike walked around and pointed at trees he liked and pointed them where he liked it. And we tried to hide a building, <laughs> a two-story building on one side of the road. You know, and then we made a facade out of one side of the building. It's fairly impressive that Four guys did it, you know, at all in six weeks with like two or three daily laborers. Who, and we all had to bring our own lunch at the time. And there was no power or running water. <laughs> you know, for us to build a trailer park is fairly inexpensive. Because we, we buy uh, old trailers that no one has any use for whatsoever. There's sort of a, two types of trailers. Uh, and here's a, good, here's a good example. Like you can't. You can almost smell it from here. This is a, <laughs> this is probably an eviction trailer. The, the eviction trailers are the ones where people get kicked out and then they kind of vandalize it 
It smells like uh, different types of pee. <laughs> and we'll take those trailers for free. You know, even the cost of moving them here, these companies will call us and beg us to take them. Because what else are they going to do with them, right? They might just be used for scrap for windows or whatever. Uh, so we can get them for 500 bucks, a thousand dollars, or even two thousand dollars. There's also trade-in trailers. Trade-ins are nicer. Trade-ins are usually well kept by uh, people who who kind of uh, live in parks and just upgrade. We probably paid good money for about half, maybe at the most. I think we paid a thousand bucks for that trailer. No more than that, that's for sure. It might have been a freebie. We get a lot of freebies if we buy one. We get four or five for free. Across the street is the uh, AD trailer, a totally rough looking trailer, but Mike uh, Kleinberg loved this trailer. Uh, there were two trailers I loved. Uh, one was the 67 Skyline, which Andy immediately moved into, and it became his production office. And uh, there was a, uh, the AD trailer was, was in really rough shape, and I just liked the look of it and liked the color of it. Um, and it just had this real hard edge about it, and uh, I loved it. This was free. Andy often jokes with me that the camera and the park are Mike's mistress. Well, I have a feeling that art director Andy is a close second. It's one thing to build a trailer park, but it's another thing to dress it and make it look like home. A lot of the art direction are found materials. I mean, they dig through garbage, you know. The, because of the, the, the art direction needs of a trailer park, they like stuff that's a little beat up and used, you know, the barbecues and even the furniture that are in the trailers, a lot of it's been recycled off of. You know, in every neighborhood, the, like once a, twice a year or so, they have a put all your big trash out on the street. That's when we do our uh, set decorating. Yeah, this driveway costs more than that trailer and everything in it. I mean, look at that. I mean, that's definitely from the side of the road, that stereo. That did not, did not come from anywhere that cost money. I think we, we paid money for the fans, too. I think I paid, at the most, like 15 bucks at Value Village. And this is a nice hand-painted fan, I must say. That might disappear at the end of the year. You never know. This is another piece of found art. Dolce & Gabbana got them somewhere. I don't think they paid money for it, though. So we did pay money for this. But not much, because he had a coupon. I spent a lot of money at Dollarama. We had to buy like 12 of these because whenever we move the car in and out, someone runs them over. Some lady who lived outside of the Green Ridge trailer park last year had it outside and basically begged me to take this carpet away from her. $75 working TV. That's taxes in. That van came from Moncton. Someone made it in shop class or something. It's got the dude's name in 1978 carved in the bottom. It's ceramic. He had time to make beer can art. Look. Well, we make time for beer can art. <laughs> Come check this wallpaper out. <laughs> you don't see that every day. Five bucks a roll, probably a total of 20 bucks. I mean, I don't even know what these are, but they somehow work. <laughs> uh, yeah. I think part of the charm of the show is the fact things look cheap because we do them cheap. And, and that's sort of the, sort of the tone uh, that's always been in place with this show. To maintain that is a really fine line because once you start spending too much money, it may lose its sort of that sort of amateurish um, mockumentary style. And, and I know that Klattenberg hangs on to that tenaciously. He does not want the show to start looking expensive. Oh, here's one of your favorite scenes, Handy 10XX. <laughs> I like and it when it's triple X better. <laughs> that means to be determined. That would mean... That means to be written on the day. Written on the day, yeah, for we sure. Really like that. It's a classic. Yeah. It's a classic. What do you think you'll need for props for scene 10XX? <laughs> Ricky's lighter. Ricky's, yeah. How many cars? Well, they, none of them work, so all okay. of them. <laughs> Those cars have fucked me around so many times when I'm trying to shoot a scene, stalling and fucked up. I'm trying to shoot the show, we're rewriting it usually as we're doing it, and it's pretty high pressure to get it done, and then the cars don't work. Is there anything we could shoot while they're getting it fixed? The only way we could shoot it is if I was in the car and we had four guys pushing it, or something like that. I mean, The Leahy mobile is fucked all the time, the shipmobile is fucked all the time. Having problems with the uh, shipmobile this morning, Preston? Nope, it's shitty, as per usual. If it was anything else, we wouldn't be able to call it the shipmobile, it's like a trademark thing. Put the car in park or neutral, Brett. It's in drive. 
That shipmobile, by the way, is our car, the one Mike and I drove until a couple of years ago. We finally retired it to the park permanently because it became just too unsightly to have parked in front of the house. A perfect example of how Andy interprets the script and gives it 100% is Ray's trailer burning down. Now with um, logistics and things, sometimes you have to shoot out a sequence. We had to shoot the trailer burnt before we actually saw it unburnt. When I walked on set and saw that trailer, uh, I couldn't believe that they'd put so much work into the detail. Um, Al Barber and Andy and uh, Dolce and Gabbana, um, they really, it was, to them it was a great challenge and a bit of a masterpiece for them. It wasn't just like, we got to do this. They, they really looked, sat back at it and were very proud of the work they put in it and, and created this convincing burnt trailer. The fire department showed up when we finally did the scene of uh, when the trailer had burnt down and the guys were like, that's what it looks like. You know, and that's it's perfect. Soft from all the fucking heat. Please, just get the hose and shit off there, everything. The reason we had to shoot the burnt trailer first was we needed the unburnt trailer to shoot the Christmas special. All right. Do you know anything about the Christmas uh, script or anything? Have you heard anything from Ken? I heard there isn't one. <laughs> I have it all on the same page. <laughs> the whole park's going to be covered in snow. But depending on the budget, that snow just might be white blankets. <laughs> If we can't afford uh, blankets, we have paper towels and toilet paper standing by. We're going to cover the park. It'll be a white Christmas. 400 bucks and a little bit of imagination. It'll look like Santa Claus is coming to fucking town. Our whole show is we're trying to ask people to pretend that it's a real world. Because of that documentary format, mockumentary format, we want people to believe that this is, really exists. So that even when they turn off their TV sets at night, Ricky, Julian, and Bubbles still survive. They still have their own little world. These are the things we can do in the winter. It was important to Mike that his trailer park be as believable as his characters. Between Mike's vision for the park and Andy and his team's interpretation, Sunnyvale became a reality. I don't want to lose you when we're walking on a frozen lake. Probably the best uh, ensemble cast in Canada, I think, without a doubt. Probably some of the best kind of comedy that's uh, ever been done, too, I think, in Canada. The success of Trailer Park Boys has brought some obvious rewards, but it's the unexpected rewards, the friends that we've made and the family we've found, that are the biggest surprise. Hey, what about that shirt? That's an aggressive shirt, man. You are not afraid. I am not afraid. You're going afraid. to take some heat about that today. I'm okay with that. We've had pretty much the exact same crew for five seasons now. There hasn't been a loyalty to the show that I haven't seen in other shows. I think it's on many levels. Uh, uh, personal, I think uh, people just respect the hell out of Clattenburg in terms of his vision as a director. I think that people find me sexy. Cool pants, popular in style. <laughs> But now it's, I'm part of the Destiny's Child fan club because some people are jealous of how cool my pants are. A lot of directors are not sexy, they have big guts. And uh, also the clothes that I wear, the hairstyles. Um, I mean, I'm, you know, I don't work out or anything like that, but I think people notice that kind of stuff and they kind of see, uh, you know, it's cool to hang out and work for a sexy director. I think the shooting style, the, the process, right from the start we never wanted to be business as usual. And so we're not that mechanical, army-like structure when it comes to production. Plus, it's fun to be around. It is a fun show to be around. And I think if you shoot an arrow at Trailer Park Boys, you're going to hit Clattenburg. That group that works with him is incredibly dedicated because he gives him so much space to participate. So he's a, he's a phenomenal leader. And he's able to lead those people while taking full responsibility for everything and sharing in all the, all the credit for it. I mean, he's got a huge future, because if you've been a part of that, it's very hard not to be a part of that again. And to, to be so deeply involved in something, to feel a sense of, of, of personal creative ownership that he allows you to feel. And, and yet at the same time, it's completely his. The greatest thing about the success of the show is it puts a lot of pressure on us to, uh, to deliver every year. So we're always fine-tuning our craft. We're all learning a lot about writing. Uh, directing, acting, and we're all getting better as a troupe. Um, we've been able to, um, to pull together um, a wonderful trailer park. It's much bigger now, 
and um, we're able to do the show. We're able to make a living out here um, in in the arts, and uh, it's great. I mean, you, you you know, you couldn't ask for anything more. Mike always knew there'd be an audience for Trailer Park Boys. He never wavered on that. And the greatest thing I've always known about Mike is that he has an innate sense of what is hip, cool, and funny. He's always ahead of the trend. Every day, Mike and I wake up and pinch ourselves. Trailer Park Boys has surpassed even our wildest dreams. Why do you act so shy? I think one of the coolest parts of my job is actually seeing reporters who in season one and season two, you know, panned the show, really didn't like it, and, and it pointed out all the negative things about, you know, this show. And then in season three, there were a couple of them who did a complete 180 and decided, jumped on the bandwagon and decided that it was the greatest show ever and now are, are complete fans. One of those prominent journalists was John Doyle. His review was the first we read, and we were so disappointed, thinking that maybe Canadians weren't going to get this show. What I can remember about the very first time I saw Trailer Park Boys is a certain amount of mystification um, about what uh, Showcase was doing in uh, airing this show and exactly what it was presenting. You're going to be a great big star, G. It was a certain amount of disappointment, too. And I don't think that was entirely my fault, or I was unique in my response to it. I would be really excited to find out, you know, what what made John Doyle change his mind because he's a he's a hugely prominent journalist. He, you know, has got a huge column in the Globe and Mail, and he was one of the big ones. The first people I heard talking about it were people in the music business, uh, you know, rock and roll types, um, who uh, mentioned that they were watching it and that inside um, the rock and roll world, um, the show had some cachet. Uh, and, and was uh, was a favorite among musicians and people like that. That kind of intrigued me. Ricky, you're forcing Rita McNeil and her band to harvest dope at gunpoint. You could be a little bit fucking nicer, you know. Between season one and season two, I think, um, well, I don't know exactly what happened in between, but when season two aired, the, um, um, the, the sort of modus operandi of the show became clear. Bubbles, what the fuck are you doing? What these are you doing? These charts are public domain, Ricky. What's up? No, man. That's... Well, let's get back here, you dick. <laughs> Fuck! The comedy credentials, I think, became slowly established in, uh, in season two, which meant that it certainly it clicked with me, and I think started to click with viewers. Hi, I'm Patrick Paul Resney from London, Ontario, and I'm a huge Trailer Park fan. And I'm Sherry Long from London, Ontario, and I'm a huge Trailer Park fan. What makes you guys big Trailer Park fans? Uh, everybody says I kind of look like Ricky, and I act like him sometimes. <laughs> Only when I've been drinking, though. All three of us were, were absolutely committed to the notion that there would be an audience for this. We had no idea how big it would be, but we knew there would be other like-minded people out there that would, that would dig it in the same way. It stands an example of, of Canadian television being very cool, having that ca cachet with um, with the young hip audience that Canadian television very rarely does. That's the major change. It stands as an example of that. Oh, I think Trailer Park Boys has completely changed the face of Canadian television, and I, I you know I, I'm both horrified and thrilled when I see other broadcasters try to borrow from our our formats. Here to discuss what was involved in creating a series that's a bona fide hit with fans and critics alike and how this series went on to challenge convention and break new ground in television production. I think we are now sort of um, the template. There's got to be some new kid who's going to have to say to, to break the trailer park boys, you know? And that may take a while to happen. God knows in this country it's hard to make a TV show, let alone a big hit. The follow-up really is how do, you, how do you do the next one? You know, because uh, we've set the bar so high. Um, that everything seems, in our minds, is always going to be judged according to what has become a real huge hit. Dolly Parton said, it's good to be first, best, or different. And so, if you can be two or three of those things, that's really good. If you can be three or three, well, that's tremendous. In TV, you can either throw money at the screen or you can throw your brain at the screen. And in this case, I think everyone on the team of Trailer Park Boys should be commended for throwing their brain at the screen. Why don't you try? At the end of shooting each season, questions come to light like, is this it? 
Is this the end? Have we shot our last season? Is this goodbye to Sunnyvale, my home away from home since 1998? 2005 brought us a feature-length film, and international sales have brought viewers from around the world to Sunnyvale. But after all that is said and done, I can only speculate what everyone will do after Trailer Park Boys is completed. I hate to say this, guys, but that's a season five wrap of Mr. Rob Wells and Mr. Mike Smith. Most of the crew will move on to other film sets. The producers will find new projects to produce, and the actors will find new gigs. But the one thing I am sure of is everyone who's been involved with Trailer Park Boys will have left a corner of their heart in Dartmouth, the home of the Trailer Park Boys. I like your Sunnyvale smile I love your frisky sense of style Sit down with rum and coke for dessert, a little toast. 